Well, good evening, Central. Uh, here we are still in the uncertainties of what is lying ahead for us. Uh, but it looks like, once again, we are stuck doing the live streaming and, and the videos. Once again, I do want to encourage you to get on our Facebook page, Central Baptist Church Martin, Tennessee. Also, our YouTube channel that we launched at the beginning of the week. Uh, we are putting our messages on there. Not only that, but in each ministry uh, we are attaching the ministry lessons there as well. Brother Casey is using that and Instagram. Also, so is Brother Tim for the children's ministry. And, uh, and each staff member is going to be posting different devotionals on there for us um, and for you to be able to see. So please go on there and, and check those out. But for tonight, Wednesday night, uh, I wanted to share with you what the Lord has laid on my heart. And so I ask if you will please take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 5. As we look at this together, you know, everyone knows that we are definitely in uncertain times and there are a lot of questions out there and families are living in a state of fear and, and maybe there are some families out there, maybe you are already struggling, not knowing how this is all going to really turn out. And, and there is no doubt that there is a spirit of worry and fear that is running rampant across the entire world right now um, that as believers I want to remind you what the Apostle Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. He said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And so remember that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I know that deep down, as believers, you may be saying, Well, Brother Colin, I, I know that. I, I, I know that, and I, I've heard that, and, and you're right. And, and thanks for the reminder, but bills are due. Bills are due and companies are already laying off and, and the numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, the numbers just continue to rise over and over and, and the media just keeps pushing it and pushing it. So, so Brother Colin, I, I hear what you're saying. But this is also one of those things that we sit back and say, maybe it's easier said than done. And listen, I, I completely understand. And I also tell you that, that you know what, I would be very, uh, you know, um, you know, hypocritical if I didn't tell you that I'm not a little bit worried. Um, yeah, I am. And, and, you know, as a matter of fact, I have to keep reminding myself that my faith has to overcome my flesh. And, and that's what I want you to tell yourself as well, that faith has to overcome flesh. You know, it's easy to trust God when everything is going okay. And, and it's easy even, let me just go this far, say, is it's easy to tithe and, and to give our offerings when everything is fine. But what about when it's not? What about when it's not? You, you know, it, it, I was talking with someone today and, and, I, and I reminded them that our faithfulness, once again, that faithfulness is not based off of our abundance. Our faithfulness is not based off of our abundance. We are called to be faithful even in times of uncertainty, which, by the way, in reality is the whole point. <laughs> and I want you to think about that. And maybe during this time, God is wanting to teach the American church, not only that, but casual Christianity in itself. Um, the, the lesson that truly following him means that we trust him. It means that we trust him. Even when we're not sure how we are going to get through, we trust him. You know, going back to the whole tithe issue, giving of our tithes and our offerings, it has never been about giving just to be giving. I want to remind you of that. Oh, no, 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 no. It's always been about our hearts and it's been about saying, Lord, this is yours. And Lord, everything that I have is yours. Well, did you say that when everything was going fine or, or, or now are you having to prove it? Are, are you seeing that? And, and, and you know, God is, God is going to get you through. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, it is a sign of our faithfulness. Church, I want to remind you, God doesn't need your money. As a matter of fact, even as he told the Israelites through the prophet Hosea in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, he said, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. In other words, you know, he's saying, hey, I, I want your heart. That's what I want. As a matter of fact, listen to what Paul told the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 through 15, he said this, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, 
He is dispersed abroad. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through God for us, okay? Uh, thanksgiving through us to God, I'm sorry. For the administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgiving to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them with all men and by their prayer for you who long for you because of your exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Matter of fact, even if you flip back a chapter right here in this, in this exact same book, if you flip back a chapter, listen to what he had to say to the churches of Macedonia. Listen to what he said in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1 through 5. <coughs> Excuse me. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, sounds like what we're going through right now, right? In a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, listen to this, and their deep Poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift, the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Of God. So church, may we be mindful to give ourselves to God and to his will, okay? So let's be faithful and not fearful, okay? Let's be faithful and not fearful. But this message of hope that I want to give you tonight is not on our faithfulness of giving to the Lord. Matter of fact, friends, I want to talk to you why we do not fear, okay? Why we do not fear. Why should faith overcome our fear? Well, in the book of Romans, chapter 5, right here, that's what I want us to see. In verses 1 through 5, we see some pretty good reasons why we should not fear. So take your Bibles and look with me, if you will. Romans, chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, says this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. You know, let me ask you this question. Let, let me ask you, have you ever been facing a situation and maybe you were terrified about going through it? You know, maybe it was a situation that, that you had to talk to someone about a situation or, or maybe you were facing a situation to where maybe your boss said, hey, I need to see you in my office, right? You know, maybe there was something like that or maybe you had to do something and you're terrified to, to face it, right? You were terrified uh, that, that it was not going to end well. But then you go through it. And then you go through it and you're like, wait a minute, that wasn't so bad, <laughs> right? That wasn't so bad. And, and what has ended up happening is that we've made the situation worse than it really was. Yeah, you've done that. And you know what? I've done it as well. We've all done that. Well, friends, I want to remind you that one of Satan's primary tactics is that of fear and worry. Because if he can cause us to have fear and worry, then you know what he does? He cripples us from moving forward with the gospel. That's what he does. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why, you know, we need to even put on the helmet of salvation during this time so that our minds and our focus can be on the salvation of the Lord and what he has done for us instead of what's going on around us right now. Maybe that's why we need to put on that helmet. But church, I want to remind you that as believers, our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is not in ourselves, but in our great God, who, as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, he said, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. You know, friends, with, while continued faith is necessary, I want to remind you that our being able to hold fast is founded upon his faithfulness, not our own. Not our own. So looking at our text right here tonight, 
I want us to see why we don't have to fear. Why we don't have to fear. Let's see how faith always triumphs over fear. Think about that. Why does faith always triumph over fear? Well, first of all, friends, I want you to see that we don't fear. Why? Because of, number one, who we are. Because of who we are. Look at the first part of verse 1 again. I know it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith. Having been justified by faith. You see, there's that term, therefore, again. That's been popping up a lot uh, recently in our text that we've been looking at. The term, therefore. When you go back and you study chapters 3 and 4, you find that Paul had just spent an incredible amount of time talking about the fact that because of Christ and because of what he did for us, that he has justified us. And we're going to see more about that in just a moment. But now, because of Christ, we have peace with God. God. And let's talk about this. Let's talk about who we are. What does it really mean that we are justified? What does that mean? Well, first and foremost, I want you to notice that phrase once again. Notice the phrase, having been justified by faith. You know what that really means? It means that it's already done for the believer. It's already done. In other words, listen to me, church. Because of the works of Christ, the moment that we trust in Him as our Lord and Savior, we were justified in the eyes of the Father. It was a done deal. And so right here, listen to me, friends, we cannot take for granted the fact that we've been given a huge benefit by accepting Jesus Christ, okay? We've been given a huge benefit here. The back to what the word justified means. Basically, it means this, to, to be declared righteous. To be declared righteous. It is the word dikothethenes, which means to look upon one as righteous. To look upon one as righteous. Church, let this sink in for a moment. Really let this sink in. Even though, even though we claim Christ, we're still in the flesh. We are still in this flesh. We are still sinners. We still have the capability to sin. Now listen, friends. Justification does not mean that God is not aware of our sins, but it does mean that in spite of our sins, God treats us and sees us as if we're not sinners. Oh my goodness. Think about that. Even though we are unrighteous and wicked, God treats us as though we are not sinners. Even though, once again, He treats us unlike what we really are. Even though we are, uh, we are, uh, you know, even though we're ugly, downright stinking sinners, <laughs> I can't stress that enough. Church, I want to remind you: it's so good the fact that God treats us as though we are as righteous and as pure as His own Son, because we've been covered by the blood of His Son. We are covered by His blood. Now I want to remind you of something. Listen to me, friends. This is not a license to be able to go off and do whatever you want to do and act however you want to act. No, no, no. Because the Bible says that you are no longer your own. You've been bought. You belong to him. You were bought with the price, the blood of Jesus. And also, I'll go ahead and tell you, I believe that because of the work of the Holy Spirit within me, I don't want to live in sin anymore. I, I don't want to do that. I want to please my Heavenly Father and I want to live a life that is pleasing to him. And so when I do sin, I want you to know that doesn't matter, matter if I sin, no, but when I sin. When I do sin, once again, friends, you know what happens? That Holy Spirit convicts me and works in me. You know, it's as if someone once said, someone did say this, someone once said, justification does not mean that we are perfect. It just means that God sees us as though we are. Wow, what a great statement. I want to repeat that. Justification does not mean that we are perfect. It just means that God sees us as though we are. Wow, what a statement. And this is where I, I simply want to sit back and say, praise God. Praise God. Why? Because I know who I am. <laughs> I know the things I've done. But I want to say, praise God. You know, if we could ever just remember this and just ever let this truly sink deep down in our hearts and minds, I think this would change the world. I think it would definitely change us. You know, if we could just remember that, it, it would definitely change us. But don't miss those last two words of the first part of that text right there. By faith. 
Church, I, I'll go ahead and tell you, I, I'm so thankful this evening that I am who I am in Christ and that my eternal salvation is the product of faith by grace through faith. By grace through faith. Listen to me. I know that if it relied upon my own ability to perform, it would be over. <laughs> I, I would be done for. Probably by the end of the day, if we, if we were all real here. If it required me to keep a, a list of, of certain rights that I had to do and I had to accomplish by the end of the day, guess what? It would be over. I would be lost. Thank God. It's all by faith. It's all by faith. So first of all, we shouldn't fear because of who we are. But number two, secondly, faith triumphs over fear because of what we have. Because of what we have. Look at the second part of verse one going into verse two again. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, the verb translated there, we have, is in the present tense, indicating something that is already possessed. Remember what we've already seen. Remember, we have been justified, and because we've been justified, we have peace. It's something that's already done. The moment we place our trust and our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. Now, when you really look at this text, when you really look at this text, you see if the peace that Paul's talking about here is not subjective, but objective. It's not subjective, it's objective. In other words, listen to me, friends, it's not a feeling, it's a fact. I'm going to say that again. It's not a feeling, it's a fact. Let me explain. You see, apart from Christ, we are at war with God, whether you realize it or not. As a matter of fact, go ahead and look on down again in verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Did you catch that? We were enemies of God. We were enemies of God. But now through our faith in Christ, our war with the Father has ended for all eternity. It's a done deal. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, most lost people do not see themselves as being enemies of God. No, no, no. More than likely, they see themselves as being in a neutral state with God. And what I mean by that is, yes, they believe in God, but they're just not going to live for him. Yeah, they believe there is a God because evidence, you know, they can look around and see, well, you know, God had to create this. There had to be some being out there. But you know what? They're going to live in a neutral state. They're not going to live for him. Well, friends, something I want to remind you is that neutrality with God is impossible. Neutrality with God is impossible. Matter of fact, take your Bibles and flip over to chapter 8. Listen to this passage right here. In chapter 8, verse 5 through 9, it says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be so then those who are in flesh cannot please God but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ he is not his so listen neutrality with God doesn't work as long as you're in the flesh, guess what? You're enemies with God. And that's what it says right there. That's what it's talking about. You're not for God. But now the salvation, our salvation, what we have in Christ, brings with us, brings with it the peace of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Listen to me. I have a peace. I have a peace uh, of now knowing that God's wrath has been eternally turned away from me. And one day, I will have eternal happiness with him. I know that. I have that peace of knowing. Matter of fact, Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 says, And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Because of the blood of Jesus, and because I've accepted what he's done for me by that faith, guess what? I'm cleansed. 
Not only that, friends, I want to remind you, I've been reconciled to God the Father himself. But the Bible says right here back in our main text, it tells us, you know what, that we have more than peace. That's right. This passage right here tells us that we have direct access with God the Father himself. Now being a child of God, I have direct access with God the Father himself. We can enter into the very presence of God himself without fear, knowing that he is for us. Think about that. Knowing that he's for us, we can now enter into the presence of of the creator of everything. Why? We can enter into the holy of holies. We don't have to act like the priests did back in, in the days of the Old Testament when they enter in just one day of year into the holy of holies. Now we have direct access with the holy of holies all the time because of Jesus and because he's made that way. We have that ability. We can enter into the very presence of God without fear. Let me ask you this question. Knowing that, knowing that, that we can climb up into the arms of our Father anytime we want to, and knowing that He is going to take care of us, and knowing that He wants us to come to Him, why should we fear what's going on in the world right now? Why should we fear? We have the very ear of God listening to us, wanting what's best for us. Why should we fear? Now, I love that phrase in our text right here, we stand. We stand. You see, the word stand here is histamon, histamon. And it carries the idea of permanence or being firmly fixed. How about this one? Immovable. Histamon means immovable. Being permanently fixed, immovable. Basically, friends, the Bible teaches us that we are absolutely secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, friends, this verse is all about our eternal security as believers. Church, although our faith is uh, necessary for salvation, it is God's grace and not the believer's faith that has the power to save us and to keep us saved. That's something to think about. Now, very quickly. Let's put all of this together because here's where it gets really good, okay? Let's put all of this together. We see just in these two verses alone, these two verses right here, we see according to verse 1 that we're saved or justified by faith, right? Yeah, so that's what we see. That is, we did not earn, buy, or even get as a reward. Salvation was given to us as a gift. Okay, so if that's true, if that's true, then verse 2 says that we stand, or in other words, once again, remember, firmly fixed, immovable, right? Permanently fixed in a place. It says that we stand by grace, by grace. In other words, it was faith that saved the soul, and it's grace that keeps the soul. It was faith that saves the soul, but it's grace that keeps the soul. Faith that saved the soul, grace that keeps the soul. So let's don't fear because of who we are. And there's no reason to fear because of what we have in him. But finally, and I'll close off with this one tonight, faith triumphs over fear because of where our hope lies. Because of where our hope lies. Listen to verse 3 through 5 again. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You know, I want to ask you this question. Why do events like what's going on right now, why do these events catch us by surprise? Why do these situations catch us by surprise? You know, even Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is, coming to, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. He said, why do you consider these things strange? You know, sometimes these situations prove who's actually true in Christ and who's not. You know, our world, sadly, there are many casual Christians out there, as I call it, there are those that, yeah, they claim Christ and they claim him when everything is good. But the moment things start going downhill, 
they hit the by roads. They, they said, no, nope, we're out of here. No, nope, we can't have this. Why would we follow a God that's going to allow this? You know what? First Peter right there says, why are you considered strange? These things are to try you. Are you who you claim to be? Think about that. But then our text right here even says, our text and our main passage tells us that this is a time for growth. Believers, get your head up. Don't fear because of this time. This time is a time for growth that, that when it is all over, our faith will be made stronger. Read that list again. We glory in tribulation. So that's what I'm telling you to do. Keep your head up. During this time, what we're going to glory in this, we're going to give God praise in the midst of the storm. Why? Because it knows what he says, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character is going to produce hope. That's what he is saying right there. You know, when this is all over, our faith will be made stronger for those of us that continue to hold on to the hand of Jesus. Our faith will be made stronger. Why? Because our faith is not in the almighty dollar. Our faith is not in the stock market. Our faith and our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in the Lord. And according to verse 5, our hope does not disappoint. It does not disappoint. Church, he will never disappoint us. He will never disappoint us. In the midst of these uncertain times, we have no reason to fear because our hope will always come through. And church, I want to remind you of the hope that we have in Christ. Continue to give him glory. Continue to give him praise, even in the midst of this. And don't fear because our hope will never disappoint. Church, I want to remind you of if you're here today and you're watching or you're here watching this, this video today, I want to remind you that Jesus will never disappoint you. And if you're someone that's watching this that you know you don't have a relationship with Christ, I want to tell you right now and I want to give you a surety that there is a hope that will never disappoint you and he will get you through these troubling times. His name is Jesus and he loves you and he cares for you and he wants you to come to him and he wants you to put your trust in him, not in the stock market, not in our economy, not in our president, not in anything else. Our hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. If you need to accept him, I pray that you'll contact us at Central Baptist Church. Talk to us. We'd love to introduce you to this hope that I've been talking about today. I'd love to tell you about why we don't have to fear because God is in control and he has given us so much because of who we are, because of what we have, because of where our hope lies. We don't have a reason to fear. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon.